Hi guys, Dane here and welcome to my December 2023 reading wrap up. I have two books for you to wrap up for you today. Dane reads. The first of those is New Moon by Stephanie Meyer. So this is Twilight book two. Yes, I am reading the Twilight books. They're surprisingly okay. I mean, I gave probably New Moon probably like a 3.5 out of 5 and a relatively weak one. I thought the first book was better, but I do appreciate that the, the stakes are getting um, raised here. So I'm looking forward to seeing what the rest of the series brings. It's it's just an entertaining yarn, really. I mean, I've never seen the movies or anything, so I didn't know what to expect. I think if I had seen the movies, I think I probably would have been bored by the books. Um, but I'm doing it this way around. I'm reading the books, and then I'm going to watch the movies. So yeah, that was that was that was that. Uh, and then I read Gregor and the Marks of Secret by Suzanne Collins, author of The Hunger Games. So if you watch my last wrap up, you will know that I've been reading through this series. I, I picked these books up cheap in the supermarket. Um, it's portal fantasy for a middle grade readership uh, following a kid called Gregor who's about 12 lives in New York and he goes to the underland uh, where there are like giant bats and rats and mice and stuff in this one we learn a lot more about the mice who have only been kind of background characters to this point so that was nice and overall again a bit like Twilight it's just switch your brain off reading I've been reading it while on the exercise bike at the gym as well which I think has helped because um, it's been nice and easy for me to just sort of turn my brain off and, and go ahead and read. All right, guys, just the one book to wrap up for you today. That is Earthlight by Arthur C. Clarke. Um, one of his better ones, I suppose. It's a shortish book. I mean, how many pages are we looking at? 160 odd pages. Kind of standard for this kind of uh, width of or this kind of sci fi, um, kind of the pulpy classic sci fi. And it takes place kind of in the future, a couple of centuries in the future, to a point at which. People don't necessarily have any loyalty to Earth, and particularly like the countries on Earth. Um, you know, we start with this really cool scene actually of this guy visiting the moon for the first time, and we kind of get this glimpse of what Earth light is. It's the way that um, the light from the Earth reflected from the sun, I guess, um, illuminates illuminates the moon. And yeah, it's just pretty good sci-fi. It's it's Arthur C. Clarke doing what he does best. I, I wouldn't say it's his best piece, but certainly. Um, you know he's, he's flexing his his uh, his muscles here with this one. Some good characterization, okay plotting. The pacing might be a bit slow, but overall it, it was good. Uh, it was no rendezvous with her armor. Alrighty, guys, just the one book to wrap up for you today. That is Mrs. Bradshaw's Handbook by Terry Pratchett. Um, it is a kind of uh, humorous guidebook to uh, traveling upon the Ankh-Morpork and Pork and Stoke Plains Hygienic Railway. Uh, it's got like little maps, little facts about the towns you stop at, like Hay on Ankh fun stuff there, um, cranberry, high mouldering, it's just a fun little addition to the Discworld series for uh, fans of it, fully illustrated and replete with useful tidbits. I gave it probably a 4 out of 5 because I'm a Discworld fan, if you're not a Discworld fan there's no point you reading this because it won't mean anything to you, and downstairs it sounds as though my washing machine is about to take off. Alright guys, I am in my mum's kitchen filming a little bit of wrap up because I've fallen behind with all of my filming, as you do. Um, so, we're going to start with Breaking Dawn by Stephanie Meyer, which is, yeah it was Breaking Dawn, the fourth and final book of uh, the Twilight series. Now, the, the series started pretty good. I liked book one, book one was good. Book one was like vampires, book two werewolves, book three the you know goings on between the vampires and the werewolves um but then jacob just kept sexually assaulting bella and it got really uncomfortable to read about then she got pregnant with edward's baby even though he's a vampire and he doesn't have a heartbeat so i don't understand how he got an erection because that's caused by blood going to the penis it was all very weird um yeah, I just couldn't suspend my disbelief with it anymore. Um, and also, it just ended up with all of the characters all being fundamentally unlikable. Um, so I gave it like a weak 3.5 out of 5, maybe even just a 3 out of 5. Again, strong start to the series book one. If, if you're interested, especially if you, I guess if you're a dude in your 30s like myself, um, not traditionally seen as the, the target audience for Twilight, just read book one and then call it quits. I think that's how you're going to get the best reading experience out of it. Hello, it is a uh, wrap up -y time. So I read, um, yeah, sorry for the filming angle. Also, I have wet hair. You're just going to have to deal with this. So I read Raise High the Roof Bean Carpenters and Seymour An Introduction by J.D. Salinger of, um, um, what's it called? I'm with Holden Caulfield. 
Catcher in the Rye, you have Catcher in the Rye frame, fame. He also has a book called Franny and Zoe, which I haven't read yet, but basically I guess the characters from that were in this. Uh, this is written from the point of view of this character who's Seymour's brother. Um, the first is kind of a more traditional short story about Seymour skipping his wedding day and his brother goes along to it not knowing that the, the groom isn't going to turn up and then we kind of learn a little bit more about his relationship with his brother, the kind of person his brother is, all of that stuff. Uh, and then in Seymour, an introduction, it's much more like a sit down, uh, first person, like remembrance of Seymour. That was a lot more experimental and, um, you know, it's one of those stories that had paragraphs that stretched over three pages. So it struggled to hold my attention, but it was, it was pretty good. Um, I'd give this collection as a whole a 3.5 out of 5, but it was a 4 out of 5 for uh, Raise High the Roof Beam Carpenters. Just very nice, like classic short fiction. Uh, and then Seymour in Introduction was a 3.5 out of 5. So moving on from that, we have um, Gregor and the Marks of... Hang on, what, what, which one was it? All right, so then we have Gregor and the Code of Claw, which is book number five in the Gregor the Overlander series. It kind of wraps things up. It ends in the way it kind of has to end. Uh, it actually, the, the ending of it almost reminded me of the His Dark Materials ending by Philip Pullman, and that you've kind of been building up slowly towards this, you know, teenage love story, and then they have to be separated into separate worlds. Uh, but yeah, pretty much the premise of this is just there's a big old battle. Um, you know from reading the series up to this point, at the end of series four, it kind of ends just before this battle takes place. And what's interesting, it does do a bait and switch. So you think this is the big battle that's about to happen, and then no, it doesn't, it doesn't go into that. They have like a small skirmish and retreat, and then there's a bigger battle later on. Um, we see how the prophecy is fulfilled. Um, it's very much like the coming of age of the series as well. It was a satisfying ending to it. It wasn't mind blowing, but it was pretty good. I'd give it probably a strong 3.5 out of 5. It's probably the second best book in the series, in my opinion, and uh, worth reading if you've got that far, you know? Or as the Americans would say, gotten. But that's the story for another day. I've been editing one of my books and. They wanted to use the word gotten and i said no all right i've got a few more to wrap up for you luckily i do still have some of these books knocking around uh so i read the magical mimics in oz which is wizard of oz book number 37 by jack snow um it, the introduction to this was interesting because it said it's one of the, like the darker oz books because basically you have like doppelgangers uh the bad guys in this kind of freeze the ozites in the position that they're in you know um and then like mimic them and take take over the form of their bodies. Uh, it's like, uh, what's the other thing that you'd hear about, like shadow people and all of that, you know? Um, so that was kind of the plot of this one. It was actually really interesting and really well done. Um, quite sinister at times as well. Um, overall, probably like a 3.5 out of 5, a strong one. I've been really impressed by the uh, Jack Snow Oz books and there will be more of these coming soon as well. Um, you may notice if you're watching this, it is now, it's well into January. I'm late with all of my, my wrap ups. So I'm gonna try and whiz through a few of them. Uh, then we have Deep Light by Frances Hardinge, and basically I've read three of her books now I think and each one of them has really impressed me. They've been a really good at world building to the point at which it feels as though you're reading part of a series but they're standalones. Uh, in this one it's kind of hard to explain what's going on but basically we follow these people living in kind of like like an archi archipelago or whatever it's called like lots of little islands um, and there are these huge gods like there's actually some illustrations of them somewhere in this. Yeah here we go. The, the mightiest gods of the myriad these huge gods living in the uh, water and every now and then like bits of godware which is kind of like bits of the gods bodies basically like washes up and um, we have these like roguelike kids who go off on an adventure while well, this one of them in particular goes off on an adventure and then the gods kind of come back but we learn maybe the gods aren't good to have around you know um, it's really difficult for me to talk about this without spoilers so um, yeah you're just going to have to trust me that it was very good and a review of it is coming soon. Keep your eyes peeled for that. Alright, so then I read a couple of books for cats, so I have them up there, but I, I can't reach them. I've put them up on display, but my uh, girlfriend got me for Christmas. She got me uh, Is Your Cat a Psychopath by Professor Tiddles, um, which is just a fun little... Um, you know, it's a book designed to help you to figure out if your cat is a psychopath. Obviously, your cat is a psychopath. Um, probably the most fun part about this is that it came with, like, they'd created an MBTI, a Myers-Briggs thing, um, for cats. 
which I thought was a lot of fun. Um, so yeah, I enjoyed I enjoyed reading that. Um, I didn't actually apply the Myers Briggs things to my cats because it seemed like a lot of effort, but I did think it was a cool idea that it had it included. Um, and I also read The Cat Who Taught Zen by, I believe his name was James Norbury. Uh, and this was a very beautiful book, uh, illustrated as well. And it basically tells tales of um, this cat's journey, basically. And it uses the cat's journey and the kind of adventures it has along the way and it, the people that it speaks to as a way of explaining some concepts from Japanese Zen. So that was a 4 out of 5. That one was very good. Uh, the cat, Is Your Cat a Psychopath? That was a 3.5 out of 5. I then read The Collected Poems of Allen Ginsberg, 1947 to 1997. This was a big book, about that wide, it was huge. I think about 1,200 pages. Now, I did save myself a little bit of effort because what I didn't do, I didn't bother rereading um, the section, you know, the, for example, Howl and Other Poems is in it, and I've read that, like, several times. So I didn't bother rereading the individual poetry collections that I'd already read in the past, so I just read what was new to me. Um, but it still kind of kept me going over Christmas. There's also lots of notes and essays and all of that kind of stuff. Um, I, I put in my written review of it. It's probably only going to be of interest if you're a diehard Ginsberg fan or if you just want a single reference book, especially for some of those, uh, you know, the poems that are less likely to be posted individually online. So if you're looking for a specific poem, that would be the place to go for it. Uh, but I gave it a four out of five. And then finally, I read a poetry chat book uh, by Elaine McGinty called The Grass Looks Greyer on the Other Side, but at least it's not covered in bullshit. Um, this was something that one of my friends uh, gave to me. I think they know the poet. They, they say I should try and get her on my radio show, so I probably will attempt to do that at some point. Um, but yeah, it was just a pretty bog-standard collection of poetry, to be honest. I mean, what I did like about it was that it was... You know, it was a chat book. It was handmade, hand-printed, all of that stuff. Um, it was only probably 28 pages long or something like that and I think it had four or five poems in it. I did enjoy the poems that were in it. I, I just feel as though it would have been nice to have to read more of them, you know? So, there we have it. Those are all the books that I read in the month of December 2023. It is now 2024, so I need to go ahead and work on my last you know, Q4 2023 favourites and then my overall favourites of the year so keep your eyes peeled for those. In the meantime let me know in the comments if you've read any of these books and if so what you thought of them. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit that subscribe button for more and I'll see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye bye.